Today's guest started his business seven years ago out of his garage and now has over 150 employees and will hit 25 to $30 million in sales this year. His Shark Tank deal was one of the growth drivers and he shares what it was like to be on the show from a behind the scenes perspective. His product shook up an industry that hadn't really changed since 1907. Innovation in such an old industry can make it hard to get people to change, but he found a way that can work for any unique product, including yours. Welcome to another episode of the Harvest Growth Podcast, focused on helping consumer product companies, inventors, and entrepreneurs harvest the growth potential of their product businesses. Today, I'm really excited to be speaking with Joe Altieri from FlexScreen. You can find him at flexscreen.com. We'll hear a lot more about his story, how he got started, what the product is, et cetera. This is a fascinating story. You're going to love this interview, and so I encourage you to listen. Joe, thanks so much for wel- or to joining us on the show today. Oh, I am so happy to be here. First of all, I, I have to tell you, I wish I knew about your podcast when I was starting on my journey because man, what you're doing to help inventors um, like me, I, I bet you there's so many people that have not had to stub their toe as many times as I did um, because they listen to, to you and, and the interviews that you do. So thanks for, for that. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're making me blush. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, it's, uh, I, I love it. You know, frankly, I always get asked the reason we do this. And for one, it's a lot of fun just meeting everybody I've been able to interview so far is just really fun to talk to. And you've got great backgrounds. And today, especially, I'm really excited. Um, but it, I know it's also helpful for the listeners. And it's uh, likewise, like you said, it's, it's my goal is to educate, motivate, and inspire inventors and product marketers at all stages. And I, I hear great comments coming back from good interviews like this one will be, I'm sure. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun for me too. So thank you. Let's start off by talking about the Flex screen. So for those in our audience that maybe haven't heard of it, uh, tell us, first of all, what is the product? So we uh, we have the f- world's first and only flexible window screen. I guess the kind of the name kind of um, uh, you know g- gives a little hint as to what it is. But yeah, we sell window screens, and and they're very very low profile, so you can't see them when they're installed in the window, and they're extremely easy to take out because the sides flex in. Um, they don't get damaged as easy. Uh, all the things that people hate about window screens, we've solved with with our product. And uh, that was the that was the goal. Actually, I was only trying to solve one problem um, when when I invented this, but we solved a lot of them um, that that the homeowners have with with window screens. And truthfully, I can't do it justice. You know, just talking about it, you have to see it. Um, so definitely check out our website and and see the the video um, because. You know, when you say flexible window screen to people, people are like, what do you mean? It like you have to see it. Uh, so, yeah, and, and you've done a great job on your website again, flexscreen.com. Again, we'll put that in the show notes for everybody. So, if you're driving, be sure to check it out later on to really see. There's a great video at the top of the page that in two seconds you get it, you see what it is, you understand, and also why it's important. I would feel, you know, I just, I just, took out a screen from my upstairs window this weekend. I was repainting shutters, climbing on my roof for my very first time, which I hate the heights, right? But <laughs> but part of the problem beyond that was just dealing with those screens. They get dirty. They're a mess to deal with. They're heavy, bulky, hard to get in and out. And of course, the bottom little clip was busted, right? Like mm-hmm. most of them get broken so easily. And it's, you know, I can only imagine our next windstorm and the thing's going to fly out. So it's, it's it obviously solves a lot of problems for anybody who's dealt with their own with their own screens. Can you tell us a little bit more about how'd you come up with the idea originally, other than you identified the problem, but from there, where'd you take it to actually design and develop this? So um, I didn't have a, a big uh, engineering firm that, that I was a part of or, or that I could even afford. Uh, this is birthed out of my garage. And so I've been in the window and door industry for uh, close to 25 years now. And in the window and door industry, of course, every window that that gets sold has a window screen on it. And so they are the bane of the window manufacturer's existence. They are the highest um, complaint out in the out in the field. Um, it's just tens of millions of dollars of damage that that happens um, in our industry because of window screens. And so. Um, so the, I was just trying to solve some problems that my customers had, you know, they, they didn't want the, they, they get scratched easy. We were aluminum screens, old style screens. They get scratched easy, dented easy. They just, they get damaged. Um, to the point, I think it's like three to 5% of aluminum window screens that get produced in, in the U S have to be repaired or replaced before a homeowner actually gets them in their house. So it's a, it's a huge, huge, huge number. Yeah. And so 
this was just birthed out of my customer's frustration with a product that I sold. I was a salesman for, um, you know, in the window and door industry. And one of the products I sold was window screens. And so it was just, people kept saying, can't you come up with something better? Isn't there something else out there? And I'm like, no, there just is. This is what they've always been. And um, so I literally, I, I set up a, a little workshop in my garage. I pulled my wife's Yukon out of the, the garage, told her that, hey, it'll just be out in the driveway for a couple of weeks. And two years later, <laughs> um, um, and, and again, this is just a, it was just a labor of love. It was, it was a hobby. You know, I knew that there was, there had to be something better. But um, it was nights and weekends, uh, it, you know, just just me trying to I'd go to to Lowe's and I'd walk down the aisles and go, can I make a screen out of that? Can I make a screen out of that? I'd look online, order stuff from Granger's. Um, so this is really um, product development, old school, make something from whatever you can get your hands on type of, you know, type of um, process. And uh, it took me about two years. And I, I just had um, what I call my bubble gum and duct tape prototype. Like it, literally it was ugly, it, it, you know what I mean? But it was like when I made it and I put it into the little sample window that I had, I was like, oh, I have something here. And I'm like, wonder if anybody else is going to think I have something, you know? And, and so, you know, I got, um, you know, I, I downloaded an NDA off of Google, you know, and showed it off to some of my contacts in the industry. And they said, hey, this is pretty cool. Um, we love it. Now you have to figure out how to actually make it. And, um, and if you do, we're, we're interested. And so that's how, that's how it came. Like I said, this is just, this is the old school American dream started in the garage. Um, and I'm not an engineer. I'm, I'm a sales guy. Uh, so this was just trial and error. I, I'm sure an engineer, somebody a lot smarter than me could have figured this out in two months, not two years, but, um, um, but interesting fact, I mean, window screens have been the same for over a hundred years. So a metal window screen with that rubber spline was yeah. invented in 1907, um, patented wow. in 1907. And so, you know, it was really a industry that was ripe for disruption. I didn't know it at the time. You know what I mean? It was just, Hey, this is what, what has always been done. Um, but it was just an industry that was ripe for, for disruption because nothing had changed. Um, which is great in some ways because nothing had changed and a real pain in the butt in a lot of ways because nothing had changed. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so again, I, I'm sure we can talk about that a little bit more, but that, that was, um, you know, changing a mature industry is, is tough. You can have the best idea in the world. You can have the greatest invention, the greatest product and trying to change people's perspective off of something, the way that they've always done it. Um, you know, it looks different. It tastes different. It feels different. Um, man, that's a, that took us years to get to the point where we've actually had, you know, started to, the, the snowball has gotten to the point where there's been market acceptance on our product. You know, I talked to a lot of inventors and many that we've worked with over the years, and we've, we've launched hundreds, hundreds of products ourselves I mean, for clients, et cetera. But one of the common themes is it's difficult to change consumers' minds, right? Where it's, mm -hmm. if they've been doing one thing this way, you've got to educate them to know, well, there's a whole other way of doing it. For you, I imagine there's kind of the double problem. You've got consumers' minds that buy the windscreens, but you've also got the dealer or manufacturer side that you sell. On the B2B side, they're also ingrained and probably be more so, right? But they've got their system set up for these old, for the old way of doing it, for the old screens, et cetera. Uh, did you see a big difference? Was it harder to, to educate or to change one audience versus another? So the problem that we faced was we, I, I was in the industry. And so when I came out with the, the finished product and we actually started manufacturing, um, you know, we got really famous in our industry really, really fast um, because we won a bunch of awards. You, you know what I mean? Like everybody that I showed it to loved it. The problem was the window manufacturers weren't the end consumer of, of the product. So the window manufacturers who that's, those are who I need to sell screens to. That's where all the, the volume is. Um, they had to they had to um, educate their dealer, and then their dealer had to educate the homeowner. And so, so it wasn't just two steps; it was three steps to to get there. And so, even though I solved a ton of problems um, for the window manufacturers and saved them money, all of that's they're like, we can't do anything unless the dealers want it. You know, unless the dealers want to change, and the yeah. dealers won't want it unless the homeowners want it. And so. You know, we're just to give you an example, you know, we did $400,000 worth of business in our first year. 
that that might seem like a lot. It is nothing. We're doing more than that every week right now. I mean, it was, we had millions of dollars invested in our first year of business. We did 400,000. Like it didn't come close to paying the bills. Um, and, and it was really disappointing because again, I had letters from window manufacturers saying, this is the greatest thing that's yeah, been yeah. in. I mean, it was just, you know, the, the investor pack was, was outstanding. Like I had people lining up to invest, um, but I couldn't get past, I, I couldn't get to, to the, the, um, the consumers that actually needed to accept our product. And so, you know, we, uh, we just started the, you know, trying to come up with ways like, cause I couldn't afford a Super Bowl ad. I couldn't do, you know what I mean? Like I couldn't do like the tr traditional marketing. And so we realized pretty quick, it took us about a year when, and in the whole scheme of things, that's pretty quick, but it took us about a year to understand that we were, we were, our message was going to the wrong people. And so we started doing stuff to get to the homeowners and we did it through social media. Like we just yeah. had no choice. We yeah. didn't have the, we didn't have the money. Um, so we, you know, we just started, um, filming fun videos, you know, me making fun of myself, you know, throwing screens off the of buildings, running them over with cars, hitting them with hammers. Um, it, you know, and, and so a couple of our videos just blew up and, um, which, you know, got the attention of homeowners, which then started driving some demand, um, to the window manufacturers. And that's how shark tank came about as well, you know, through those, those social media efforts. Yeah. From what I understand, you know, there's so many people have this dream of being on Shark Tank and it can be a great boon to your business for sure. But they approached you, right? From originally as opposed to you reaching out to them. That's not a normal story. How did that happen? It, it isn't. And we actually thought it was a joke. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, the one thing that, uh, and I'm sure most of your listeners hear this, you know, if you have something cool, you know, it was, you should go on Shark Tank, you should go on Shark Tank. And so I had yeah. heard that for, for the couple of years that we had um, been in business before, before Shark Tank. And so when they called us, they left a message on our, on our voicemail, like, ah, oh, this is somebody, you know, one of my buddies, you know, giving me a hard time. And then they sent an email um, the next day. And I'm like, well, they really put some effort into to this. And then the callback number was Sony Picture Studios. And um, I'm like, well, okay, well, this might be real. Like, like literally when I, when I went home and told my wife, you know, when I finally like clicked that this might be real, I'm like, I'm like 70, 30, like there's still a pretty good chance yeah. that this is a joke, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but, but shark, somebody uh, supposedly from shark tank reached out to us. And, and so, but yeah, they, um, they reached out to us and, and, um, from my understanding, it's, you know, every year there's hundreds of people that go actually film, um, and you don't get to see all of them. Um, and of those hundreds of people that, that film, you know, they only reach out to, you know, between five to 10 companies that they actually find online. And, and so you know, the year that we shot, we were, we were one of them, but it's, um, it's incredible the the, you know, what people go through to get on a show. I mean, there's cattle calls. I mean, it's, um, somebody told me there's over a hundred thousand applications a year that they get. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we were really honored to have them actually reach out to us because again, we probably wouldn't have done it. We probably wouldn't, wouldn't have gone through all the steps because it is a process to get on, even though they contacted yeah. us, we still, all we did was kind of jump in line a little bit. We still had to go through the whole vetting process and it was, it was a lot of work. And once you got on the show, how was the experience? <laughs> Exhausting. <laughs> so, um, it's, uh. It is, it is very much like you see on, uh, on TV, except longer and more intense. Um, so, uh, the, the first thing is, you know, it is, a, it's a TV show. So they ramp up the drama yeah. and, and all that stuff. You know, Mr. Wonderful is actually a lot nicer in person than he seems like on, you know, on, on the TV show. But, um, I was in front of the sharks, like in front of the sharks, answering questions, doing everything for two hours and 37 minutes. Um, wow. It, yeah, it was nuts. So, like I, I went back, um, I went back to the hotel, you know, did a little bit of celebrating a couple of minutes celebrating. Then I slept for 15 hours. So wow. it, like, literally it is just, it, there's so much, and there's just so much pent up. Right. So you have all of this, you know, uh, months and months of prep, you know, going into it. And then, then you, you do it and it's exhausting and then it's, it's over. Right. So you have all that relief, all that adrenaline's gone and all that stuff. And I, I literally slept, slept through a day and a half. It was, it was nuts. So, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it is, it's intense. I mean, you are 
fighting for your company in front of these people and 30 million people that are going to see the episode. Uh, yeah. And that's not lost on you um, because there's 50 other people in the room with you, you know, from directors to, you know, uh, audio people and there's cameras zooming around and, and doing that stuff. You know that you are in a, um, uh, you know, a high pressure situation. Um, from the minute you strap on, I mean, and literally you, you put the, you put the microphone on and in your contract and, and they tell you this over and over again, from the time we put the microphone on to the time we take it off, we own every bit of that footage and we can mm -hmm. use it. We're, we can't, you know, they, they can't do something that makes it seem like you're, uh, they can't have you answer a different question with a different right. answer, right? They're not yep. going to, to do that, but they can use it to ramp up drama. They can, you know, do the things that people do for, for TV shows. And so you have to be really, really careful with what you say. There's no timeouts. There's no, oops, I didn't mean to say that. Um, it's, it's theirs. Um, and, it, and if you watch the episodes, there are people that do that. They're like, I didn't mean to say that. They're like, yeah, well, that's making the air. Of course it is, you know, because that's, <laughs> that's good TV. Yeah. So, um, so, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was a great experience overall, but, uh, I, I tell people this, it, I would do it again tomorrow. Um, but I would not do it again for the first time. If, if that makes sense, like knowing what I go, what, what I went through at, at up to that point, I probably would not, um, cause it's just, it's so much stress. It really, really is. Yeah. Um, yeah. but once you do it and once all those expect, you know, once all that anxiety goes away, like I said, I have, have no problem, you know, going and doing it again. Uh, it's probably a lot like jumping out of an airplane, you know, the first time, yep. you know, is terrifying. The second time you're like, yeah, I've been here, done that. My feet are on the ground. I'll do it again. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I can only imagine that. And you did have the chance to go back on Shark Tank. So your first episode aired early 2020. Mm -hmm. And then the second one was in 2021. So just over a year later. Talk to us about that. How was the how was the second experience going on? Same product. It was just a reporting on your success. Other than that, how was it different than the first time? Well, the, the, the second, the first time is, is very impromptu, right? So you're just yep. going out there and, and everything is, it is what it is, right? Um, yeah. the, the, when they do the update episodes, it's very, it's, it's not scripted, but it's, it's, they want you to look good. You know, yeah. when you're in front of the sharks, they don't care if you look good. I mean, truthfully, right. a lot of times they don't want you to look good. You know, you know yeah. I don't say they TV. don't want you to, but the TV is better. It's if you do poorly. Yeah. And so, um, with the update episodes, they want you to look good. So, so, you know, it's, it's very storyboarded out like, Hey, we're going to do this. And then we're going to have shots of, you know, the, the factory and, you know, then we're going to have, you know, shots of Lori and, you know, all that stuff. Um, we were a little disappointed because our update was in the middle of COVID. So Lori couldn't travel. They didn't even, um, they couldn't even send a, a camera crew out. So, um, you know, we, we did everything and, and they did a doing stuff, um, through COVID shark tank. I don't know how the other TV shows did shark tank went above and beyond. Like the update episode was so well organized and the way that they did everything, it was fantastic. I mean, their producers made the shift and, uh, you know, you, you know, if, if you watch, you probably have no idea that a lot of those videos were shot on people's iPhones. Um, we have, we, luckily for us, we have a professional, you know, I have, I have people that work for me that, that do video and stuff like that. So it was a little bit easier, but a lot of what they did was, you know, people were like, you know, they were like, Hey, set up your iPhone and we're going to shoot this, you know, through, through an iPhone. And they did a great job piecing it together. But, um, hmm. but typically, you know, Lori would have come out to one of our factories or gone to home Depot cause we had just launched with home Depot and we didn't get a chance to do any of that stuff because, because of COVID. So right. we're, um, we're, we're trying to get them to do another, we have a, some, some new stuff happening and, and we're trying to get them to do another one and it looks pretty promising. So oh, maybe that, at, that, at that point, Lori will come out to our offices or, or something and, yeah, and have yeah. some fun that way. And keep us posted. Love to yeah. see that one too. Yep. How is, how is it the experience of Shark Tank? How did it help your business? I mean, uh, the Home Depot thing happened because of it. You know, we're in every single Home Depot yeah. um, in the U.S. Um, so of course that, that helped. Um, you know, there's, there's, there is a, um, a reputation that Shark Tank has, um, and the sharks have that once they put their name on something, it just, it, it gets, gives you immediate credibility. Um, yeah. that, that's huge. Um, you know, putting that as seen on Shark Tank on our packaging and, and things like that, it, it just, people trust it. 
Um, and, and again, our shark, we, we partner with Lori Grenier. People trust her and they know that she's not going to put, you know, uh, sign up with a company that that's, you know, set, you know, doing garbage. Um, and right. then again, because we're, because we're still trying to get the word out to the homeowner. So even though we were on Shark Tank, even though, you know, we have viral videos out there and all that stuff, there's still a lot of homeowners that don't know um, what, what flex screen is. And so, you know, the, the reruns and all that stuff, I mean, Shark Tank's one of the only shows in the world that runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, True. Yeah. And, and so, you know, we, we hit um, CNBC, you know, every couple of weeks we're, we're on one of our episodes is on and, and just the regular Shark Tank um, is on. We, you know, one of the fortunate things about us is our episode aired right before COVID hit. And so as, um, as they were canceling sporting events and stuff like that, they needed, um, they needed uh, programming. And so they, we got like six views in the first year of prime time. Like they canceled NBA games and they shoved shark tank in there and it was the yeah. current season. And so we got a lot of prime time um, TV in that first year, which again is really rare. It probably never happened again that that, but um, so we were kind of fortunate there, but, yeah, I mean, like I said, it's the notoriety, um, and then it, you know the the retail deals, and then of course just partnering with one of the sharks. They are really intelligent people, and they legitimately, if you strike a deal with them on the show, they they try to get that deal closed. You, you know what I mean? They they are legitimately want to invest in your company, and they want to invest not just their money, but also their their time and expertise. Lori's expertise is is um, retail. So, you know, as we were going through with Home Depot from the displays down through where everything's located, all that stuff, she was involved, um, hmm. you know, which, which was kind of surprising to me. But, but yeah, she was, she was in the middle of it. Oh, awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, you hear more and more positive news. I think there were some wrinkles the first season or two as they figured things out. But for the most part, it's been very positive. They've been, they've been really helpful to anybody, especially when they invest in them. Obviously, even without that, the PR of the show has been really beneficial for yep. those in our audience. You know, again, that may never appear on shark tank, you know, whether they want to or should or not. Um, what, what learnings have you had in your business the last few years as you've grown? So I do want to couch this with some of your success. We haven't shared yet. So you've gone from your garage literally to now 150 employees growing like gangbusters, like crazy, uh, your revenues, what are your revenues at? I think you shared your range with me before. Yeah. So, so this year we'll, we'll be between 25 to 30 million. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I'm again, from seven years ago, we were at 400,000 to, you know, 25 or 30 million. It's, we, we, we've, uh, we've grown quite a bit. We're opening up another manufacturing plant. We have seven manufacturing plants wow. now. Um, well, once, once this, the new one is open, so we'll be close to 200 employees by the end of the year. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm constantly learning. Like I said, I'm a, I'm a, a, a sales guy at heart. Now I'm running a really large, you know, corporation and, and you have to change, um, you know, who I am, you know, when I was out there putting 200,000 miles a year on my vehicle, showing off this crazy invention to now where, you know, again, you know, we're, we're hiring people. I have 200 people working for me. Um, it's a, it's a completely different, it's a, I'm, I'm a different Joe from, from, from back and, and, you know, future Joe will be completely different as well. Uh, and you yeah. have to recognize that, um, the, the team tr truthfully, the, 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 the most important thing to our success is the team that we have. I have a lot of young people that, that work for me and, um, you know, they've gone above and beyond to, you know, bring the passion that I have that I've kind of put into them. Again, we, we sell window screens, right? So, so there, there's, it's, it's not the, the sexiest thing in the world to, to get behind, but they're passionate about it and you can see their passion and, and, and that, um, you know, goes out to our customers and the, and our employees, you know, everybody from, you know, the, the guy who started yesterday understands that we have a passion for what we're doing and that we're growing and that there's tons of opportunity in our company. Uh, you know, our, some of our plant managers started off as, you know, $10 an hour employees. Now they're running um, a manufacturing plant and they have, you know, they're able to, to provide really, really well for their families now um, just because they answered an ad, um, you know, for, for a, an entry level employee. And so, uh, like I said, those types of things are just so important. Uh, you, you know, I was trying to do everything the first couple of years and I realized really quick that 
I'm going to crash and burn and yeah. I'm not doing very well at it. Yeah. And, and so I, so I had to get other people that, that, you know, I can empower. Um, I, man, I am not a micromanager at all. I'm like, look, if I give you this, it is yours. Let me know if you need any help because I just simply don't, there's not, not, not enough hours in the day. Well, I love the word you use passion. Cause it, when you find the right people, if they share your passion for your business and for the product, they're going to succeed, right? They'll figure a way to do it. You know, not everyone's going to be the best fit or the smartest or the most experienced or whatever, but if they've got that passion, like you said, they'll, they'll figure it out. They'll make it work and they'll be contributing to your team. And I think it's something that, that often gets left behind, or maybe it's secondary for product-based businesses, but it shouldn't be, right? We spend so much time focused on the product, on how do we grow the, the awareness, product sales, whatever your measure of growth is. But to make all that work, it really comes back to the team that's behind you, right? That the people that are helping you, and it's such an important element of it. So I, I, I second that for sure. And, and thank you for that advice. I, I got to ask you, so you've had a great trajectory of success. I'm sure our audience, many of them are, you know, some of them have done something similar in their business. Many of them are hoping to, right? They're looking ahead and this has been great advice. Have there been any resources that you have found especially helpful for you and your business along the way? Well, the first thing is, uh, you know, I never stop um, trying to find those resources because yeah. there's, there's people that speak to me that, um, you know, that might not speak to someone else. Um, you know, when we first started going down the social media side, you know, Gary V who's kind of cliche now, you know, listening to Gary V, but Gary V was, yeah. was the reason that we went into social media and it was just like, Hey, look, if this guy says to do it, we're going to do it. And literally we just followed his, you know, his path. Like, Hey, if you, if you create a piece of content, you can create 10 pieces of content and that's what we were doing. And, and, um, I, you know, he's not quite as relevant for our company now, but, but he was, man, his stuff was really good. And there's, there's tons of Gary V's out there that might speak better to, you know, one of your listeners than, than, than Gary did to, to me. Um, but I'm a, I'm a, uh, I love consuming knowledge. So I, I read a lot of books. Um, one important book for the, for our company was, um, a book called Fascinate by Sally Hogshead. And her whole thing was different is better than better. That's her, kind of her famous quote. And that was really important to us as we were struggling with, we have this better product, right? But I can't get anybody to buy it. And, mm -hmm. and it, you know, and, and so her whole thing was, don't talk about how much better it is. Talk about how much, how different it is. Hmm. Um, don't try to, don't try to pigeonhole your product into, you know, an evolution, make it a revolution. And, and that was, that was huge for us. And it really, um, and, and truthfully, it was somebody that I was on their podcast and they were like, you need to read this book. And I read it and I, then I read it again. And then I read it again. And it really, really, um, uh, helped us to define our marketing strategy, um, and again, it's not a marketing book per se, although she is a, a marketer. It's not like a step-by-step, -step, but it's more of a, a vision for how you can um, put, how, how you can um, position your product in, in a, a lot of times a very mature market. Yeah, it's, 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 it's fascinating. No pun intended, right? <laughs> but it's, it's a, that's really an interesting way of, of putting that. I hadn't read that book yet. I'll, I'll have to check that out too. Because, you know, we've been in the, infomercial world for a long time. So I founded this business back before Facebook and other mm -hmm. platforms were, were very big doing the as seen on TV stuff. So we do a lot on the digital side now, but, but you know, either side of the business, we deal a lot with innovation, right? And what I've, one thing I've learned over the years is there are, there's a core segment of the audience, right? Of, of consumers out there that love innovation, love new products. And if you can just hit that right audience, almost no matter what your product is, they'll jump on it. There's the other side of the market that is, they don't like, they like the old stuff, right? No matter what you tell them, no matter how much, how much better your screen is than existing screens, the hundred plus year old product they've always had, they just want to stick with it. They're very conservative in their, in their mm -hmm. choices. And man, it's going to be hard to break those down, right? And to, some eventually will buy, right? But in the beginning, focusing on different as opposed to, you know, we spend so much time often explaining why this is better than the alternative, but part of the excitement is being different, right? There's such a, there's such a, uh, a love for uniqueness, for innovation out there. It's a good way of putting that. So obviously there, you have to make your product better. They have to be happy with it once they get it. They have to see a reason to keep it and to buy more. But part of the story is the, is just being different. That's a great way of putting that. Yeah, inc incremental, um, in incremental um, improvements, a lot of consumers don't care about. 
I hate to say it like that, yeah, but they yeah. but they really don't. Um, you know, and and you look at anything from you know refrigerators. We were out looking at refrigerators the other day, and it's like it's such a boring purchase, right? But there are companies that like, oh, you touch a button and now you can see inside your refrigerator. I'm like, I have no idea why I want this, but it's so different that that I want it. And again, yeah. we bought a boring refrigerator, but it, it's just <laughs> there's there's things out there that are starting to. I mean, the iPhone is a is a Per, it's an amazing example of that. You know, the BlackBerry did a lot of what the original iPhone did, but Steve Jobs didn't go up there and say, you know, hey, this is a little bit better than the BlackBerry. Yeah. They're like, no, this is an iPhone. That's, we don't even want to talk about that. They never yeah. talk about their competition. Like, this is who we are. This is what we do. And this is, we are different. Um, and it, it's, it, it is a, it's a different way of looking at your product that again, it might might help some people to to shift a little bit to to you know make it easier for a consumer to make that decision. Yeah, yeah great way of putting that. Yep. Uh, so, Joe, this has been a great interview. Is there anything along the way I didn't ask you that you think would be helpful for our audience? Well, I, you know, the one thing is, you, you know, I guess if I can give any any advice or anything like that is just get started. Um, you know, I've had a chance through Shark Tank, you know, I've had a chance to talk to a lot of inventors, you know, or, or, or uh, you know, I, I guess I, where does the inventor moniker start? Is it because I have a product or because I actually sold something, you know, but, you know, people that have ideas and, and do have maybe some rough prototypes and, and things like that. And there's this fear of getting started. You know, yeah. that fear of, of taking that step. And, and it's really hard to get over. As somebody who's been there, done that, um, you know, one of the things when we brought in some investors, you know, part of, part of, the, the, um, uh, part of the decision was, you know, they insisted that I quit my day job, right? This had to be it. Like this was, I was burning the bridges and, uh, you know, or, or burning the ships. And, and this is my only path forward for success with my family, unless yeah. I want to go sell cars, right? <laughs> um, so, um, and, and that was a big decision, but, you know, getting started is, is probably the most difficult part of the whole journey. And, and that, um, that was key. Uh, it, it really was, um, luckily I have a wife that's really, really understanding. <laughs> I guess if I can have yeah. another piece of advice, you know, make sure that your spouse, partner, whoever is, is on board with what you're doing, because if they're not, this is going to be a really tough, um, road for you to, to go down. Yeah. You know, I, I work with people in, that own other marketing agencies and a few of them, their husband and wife work together as founding the agency. And they talk about that. I'm like, but in reality, my perspective is many of us don't do that, uh, you know, from a day-to-day -day basis, but in reality, every entrepreneur does your spouse has to be there. They are part of the business, whether they're involved or not, they are a definite part of it. They're going to go through the struggles and the joys eventually. Right. But yep. along the way, you've got to get somebody supportive. That's a, that's a great advice too. Yeah, I mean, I, I we, uh, my wife and I have talked about this in the past. You know, our business is one of our children, not mm -hmm. a mistress, um, and that is, <laughs> and, and there's a there's a huge yeah. difference there, right? It, it, there really, really is. And my wife is not involved in the day to day, but she's she's very supportive. You know, she's very supportive with me, and 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 uh, you know, our whole staff loves her, and she comes in and stuff like that. But um, but I've never made it a mistress. It's never been her. It's never been the family or the business. Um, they've been they've been part of each other. So really important. That's a great way of summarizing that too. Well, thanks again. I do want to encourage our audience, please check out flexscreen.com. You can also go and check out joealtieri.com. The spelling of both of those are, are in the show notes. Or again, if you're driving, please go back and check it out later to, to learn more about this great product and about Joe and his journey along the way as well. This is, this has is, uh, been really helpful for me and I'm sure our audience as well. Uh, I Also, be sure to check out Harvest Growth Podcast to see other episodes we've recorded. And if you like this episode and you want to learn more about how you can profitably grow your consumer product business, please subscribe to our show and leave us a review at iTunes or Google Play. 